The Scientific Method of Francis Bacon. Hey, welcome back. This is Stefan, author of In Search of the Sublime. You can read the book for free on worldhistorybook.com. Now let's start. In two earlier lectures, I've discussed the initial development of the scientific method in Greece and the Arabic world. The true watershed moment, however, had to wait until the 16th century. In this century, Francis Bacon managed to convince the scientific community to take on his method, sparking the scientific revolution. Based on his ideas, an avalanche of new discoveries came to light at a rate never seen before. Galileo managed to mathematically describe the motion of falling objects and found evidence confirming Copernicus's heliocentric model of the solar system. Harvey documented the circulation of blood. Van Leeuwenhoek discovered single-celled organisms. William Gilbert discovered that the Earth is a magnet. Torricelli studied air pressure and the vacuum. Boyle studied the properties of gases. And Huygens studied waves and circular motion. But the greatest discovery was undoubtedly Newton's discovery of the universal law of gravitation. The first mathematically precise theory of gravity. So let's now discuss what Bacon had discovered. Interestingly, Bacon did not discover anything new about the world, but instead he created a method to reliably separate credible knowledge from superstition. He set out to explicitly formulate this method, which had never been done before. He wrote his ideas down in a work called Novum Organum, or the New Organon, which was an attempt to improve on Aristotle's work called The Organon, in which the famous Greek philosopher had shown the importance of observation to understand the world. Bacon began by noticing that many of our ideas about the world are distorted by our biases, which he called the idols of the mind. As his first example, he mentioned the idols of the tribe, which are those biases that have, quote, their foundation in human nature itself. As an example, he mentioned the predilection of the human imagination to predict patterns that just aren't there. To this day, even scientists often claim to discover things that are later proven not to exist at all. Then there were the idols of the cave, which are the prejudices peculiar to the individual. Everyone, he claimed, has a cave or a den of his own, which refracts and discolors the light of nature. This is because everyone is colored by, quote, his education and conversations with others and the authority of those whom he esteems and admires. The next biases were the idols of the market, which are caused by the inaccuracies in language, as words can be imprecise or spring from false theories. And the final biases, which were the most important, he called the idols of the theater, by which he referred to the tendency of philosophers to create grand yet false theories about the world based on semi-logical arguments. We saw that the Greeks often did this in my lesson on Ptolemy and Aristotle. And we quote, Lastly, there are idols which have immigrated into man's mind from the various dogmas of philosophies and also from the wrong laws of demonstration. These I call the idols of the theater because in my judgment, all the perceived systems of philosophy are but so many stage plays representing worlds of their own creation after an unreal and scenic fashion. So quite controversially, he is now attacking basically every school of philosophy for creating fantastical theories about the world that cannot be proven. Bacon claimed that especially the Greeks had put too much emphasis on logical thinking without demanding evidence to support their claims. The Greeks were often so impressed by the internal consistency and the elegance and the simplicity of their logic that they saw no need to support their ideas with rigorous measurement. 
The Greeks, he said, had often already made up their minds before trying anything out, before performing an experiment. And as a result, their philosophizing often led to beliefs in all kinds of unfounded fantasies, as Bacon called it. Let's take an obvious example from ancient Greece. The philosopher Thales had correctly observed that water can exist as a solid, a liquid and a gas, and that water is essential for life. From this, however, he immediately went astray by concluding that then everything in the universe must in its essence be made of water. This is an example of that philosophizing going astray. Instead, Bacon recommended the systematic study of nature, also called empiricism. To obtain credible information, he claimed, scientists first have to perform repeated measurements, repeated experiments, which they have to collect impersonally, that is, without putting any interpretation on it, to avoid injecting our own prejudices into our theory. According to Bacon, we should as scientists not interpret the world ourselves, but quote, the experiment itself should judge the phenomenon. The experiment should tell us how the world works. It should not be our interpretation. Only when we've collected enough data do we finally search for patterns. In case we find a pattern, it is important to repeat the experiment a couple of times to see if this pattern persists. If it does, Bacon claimed, we have produced new knowledge. At this point, Bacon warned, we might get tempted to immediately use this new knowledge to come up with a new comprehensive system of the world, as you call it, or to immediately give metaphysicals explanation for what we've discovered. But Bacon then warned that this would almost inevitably introduce fantasy in our theories, just as happened to the Greeks. Bacon recommended avoiding these all-encompassing theories and instead just stick as closely as possible to the empirical evidence. Bacon also recognized two ways of collecting data. The first method is to observe events that naturally occur in the world around us. This was the method endorsed by Aristotle in his Organon. But, according to Bacon, this method generally only touches nature by the fingertips. There are cases where this method is appropriate, for instance when studying the stars. It's often the only thing we can do, we can observe the stars, we cannot get there. But the universe is often too complex for us to distinguish the phenomenon under investigation from whatever else happens simultaneously. And in that case, mere observation is not enough. Let's take an example from a later time period. When we study gravity, it is not sufficient to simply study falling objects, since the motion of falling objects is distorted by air friction. To avoid this problem, Bacon recommended experimentation, which requires scientists to artificially design a controlled environment in which we can isolate the phenomenon under investigation while keeping all other variables constant. For example, to this day, physics teachers show their students that a feather and a stone fall at the same rate in a vacuum. Disproving Aristotle's theory that heavy objects fall faster than light objects. By removing the air from a chamber, we remove air friction and now we can finally study gravity on its own. Only through these kind of probing tests, Bacon believed, can we truly get to the bottom of things. Or in his own words, quote, the nature of things betrays itself more readily under the vexation of art, meaning through experiment, than in their natural freedom, meaning observation. To study nature, he continued, we need to actually, quote, bring force to bear on matter, as nature reveals its secret faster, quote, if matter be laid hold on and secured by the hands. He compared this process to the immortal Proteus from Greek mythology, who would only reveal his secrets 
when handcuffed and bound up with chains. The great scientist Leibniz would later say that Bacon advocated putting nature on a rack to torture her for her secrets. Finally, Bacon also realized that science is more than just a way to satisfy our curiosity about the world, but it could also be used to improve our quality of life. He claimed that the goal of sciences is none other than this, quote, that human life be endowed with new discoveries and powers in order to establish and extend the power and dominion of the human race itself over the universe. As examples, he named the three major inventions of China. Quote, we can see this nowhere more conspicuously than in those three discoveries which were unknown to the ancients, to the Greeks, namely printing, gunpowder, and a compass. For these three inventions have changed the whole face and state of things throughout the world, such that no empire, no sect, no heavenly force seems to have exerted greater power and stimulus in human affairs. Now let's quickly study some great scientists who put Bacon's method in practice. Robert Boyle from the 17th century became the first modern chemist. Chemistry in his time had been a fraudulent and esoteric pursuit in the form of alchemy. In fact, Boyle even felt the need to apologize in the preface of his first book on chemistry for devoting himself to quote, such vain, useless, if not deceitful, a study. Boyle became determined to save chemistry from the lunacy of the past by developing an experimental philosophy, as he called it, which was highly influenced by Francis Bacon. He criticized his predecessors in his field for reaching conclusions based on insufficient evidence and unchecked assumptions. He also resisted the alchemical practice of presenting theories as undeniable God-given truths. Instead, he insisted that every theory should be regarded as an hypothesis that could in principle be overthrown if contradicting evidence was found. Boyle also set out to end the vague and inconsistent language of alchemy. Information should not be hidden, he claimed, behind a secret code language, but it should instead be written down clearly and precisely. Data should also be made public so that other scientists can reproduce the results and make improvements. He wrote, experiments should be so delivered as that an ordinary reader, if he be but acquainted with the usual chemical terms, may easily enough understand them. This way, the readers did not have to take anything on faith. In his work, The Skeptical Chemist, he described the need to, quote, draw the chemist doctrine out of their dark and smoky laboratories, the laboratories of the alchemist, and to bring it into the open light and show the weakness of their proofs. This would allow the judicious man, calmly and after due information, to disbelieve it and it would oblige abler chemists to speak plainer than hitherto has been done, to bring forth better experiments and better arguments. The great British philosopher John Locke expanded on Bacon's ideas. In his essay concerning human understanding, he set out to, quote, inquire into the certainty and extent of human knowledge. Following Aristotle, he claimed that we are born with an empty mind and that all our knowledge of the world comes from the units of experience that we receive through our senses. He wrote, let us then suppose the mind to be, as we say, a white paper, void of all characters, without any ideas. How comes it to be furnished? He asked. To this I answer in one word from experience, in that all our knowledge is founded. He then added that any philosophizing beyond what we receive through our experience is by definition mere speculation. Since without any sentry data to confirm something, we are simply unable to verify whether theories are right or wrong. 
instead of then making things up or claiming to have some special knowledge from beyond the senses, we should instead just admit our ignorance in these cases. As his main example, he tackled various theories from his time on the nature of the mind. For instance, he discussed Descartes' theory that the mind exists separate from the body. And he then asked, how can we possibly know for sure whether God has given our material body the faculty of thinking so that matter itself can think, or that God added a separate spirit to the material body without any evidence to test these claims against objective reality there's simply no way for us to find out which theory if any is correct Locke concluded that theorizing about the nature of the mind is just meaningless and philosophers who engage in it are not scientists but merely quote novelists of the mind he wrote if our faculties cannot arrive at demonstrative certainty we must content ourselves in the ignorance of the immateriality of the soul. That is the only honest thing to do in this case. Locke also realized that knowledge from the senses is never fully reliable and therefore no scientific statement can be exempt from the possibility of being disproven at a later time. Locke therefore recommended not to become too attached to any scientific viewpoint. Another great follower of Bacon was Isaac Newton. Newton discovered one mathematical law that could describe both the falling of objects on earth and also the motions of the heavenly bodies, the motion of the moon around the earth and the planets around the sun. This law of gravitation could describe these motions with astonishing mathematical precision. Yet, Newton could not explain how the sun could exert this gravitational force on the planets without being in contact with them. The sun was not touching the planets, the moon was not touching the earth. When you throw a rock, the rock is not touching the earth. So how can they be attracted to one another? Descartes had tried to solve this problem by postulating an undetectable ether that dragged the planets along in a vortex similar to that in a shower drain. But Newton, being a proud follower of Francis Bacon, refused to include such fantasies in his theory. Since there was no evidence for an ether, he, de he decided to leave the question unanswered. When criticized about the absence of a mechanical explanation for gravity, Newton wrote, I have not had yet been able to discover the reason for these properties of gravities from the phenomena or from the senses. And I do not feign hypotheses. That is his famous quote. I do not feign hypotheses. For whatever is not deduced from the phenomena must be called an hypothesis. And an hypothesis, whether metaphysical or physical, or based on occult qualities or mechanical, have no place in experimental philosophy. In this philosophy, particular propositions are inferred from the phenomena, again from the senses, and afterward rendered general by induction or by generalization. The laws of motion, which he discovered, and the law of gravity have been found by this method. And it is enough that gravity really exists and it acts according to the laws of physics that we have set forth. And it is sufficient to explain all the motions of the heavenly bodies and also of the sea. So his law could describe the motion correctly. And he was content to remain ignorant about what caused these motions. Because that could not be detected with the evidence at the time. And thus unfolded the marvelous story of the invention of the scientific method. I hope you've learned a great deal and were just as inspired as I was. If you want to know more about these topics in way more depth, read my book In Search of the Sublime. You can read the book for free on worldhistorybook.com. See you there.